Coming up on this episode of EV Revolution Show, 2023 Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV Review. Hello there, welcome and thank you for tuning in to my EV Revolution show, this edition, another vehicle review. My name is Kenneth McCoy, your host, and today I'm excited to have one of the, the world leading plug-in hybrid vehicles from a sales perspective, the 2023, this is the model year of a refreshed of a Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Thank you very much for tuning in. Also want to make sure I thank Mitsubishi Canada for allowing me the use of this press vehicle for a few days so that I could get uh, acquainted with the refreshed vehicle, do a little driving and pass on my thoughts. So let me get right into the review. Now you folks know I really prefer all electric vehicles when I'm talking about EVs, but as I keep saying, there are some good use cases for plug-in hybrid vehicles that have a big enough battery that you could basically run the vehicle in EV mode or battery only mode for a lot of your journeys, but still have a gas engine as a backup, either as a generator or, or you know, moving the wheels, sending power to the wheels to move the vehicle or a combination of that. And that's one thing that the Outlander has delivered from its inception. Now, didn't know, didn't, uh, I'm not sure if you knew, but the Outlander PHEV version has been around actually since 2013 when Mitsubishi first launched, uh, did the initial launch of this vehicles. They did a refresh in 2016. They did a US market launch in 2018. So it was actually available in other countries before it hit North America. And then in 2021, they did a uh, PHEV system upgrade. So a little bit bigger motors, a little bit bigger battery at that time. And now in 2023, they've done a complete redesign of their leading, uh, you know, again, the global leading PHEV vehicle is the Mitsubishi Outlander uh, PHEV, and they've done a great job in this 2023 refresh. So let me talk about that. Now, as you're seeing by the video and pictures, this is a fourth generation uh, redesign of the Outlander PHEV. It's got that bold, rugged design language, right? And you know, it's it's what they've had all the time. So their theory is, hey, why mess with the success of it? And I would agree. A lot of people that are looking for more of a full-size SUV want a little bit more boxier, a little bit more stand-up-ish, a little bit more rugged looking. Gives them that feel of, uh, of capabilities. And this does have off-roading capabilities. So you, you know, similar to the Jeep Wagoneer, Grand Wagoneer, something like that, you can do some, some decent off-roading in these vehicles. It's got all kinds of different drive modes for different terrain. So, you know, that ruggedness goes through on that. And sticking with the design, you know, it, it does have luxurious finishes. So it is a high-end trim and, and the build quality on this vehicle is very nice. Um, you can say that the styling is dramatic. Again, it's going to appeal to some, it's not going to appeal to others. But I have, I've had a, had a few people walk by and say, hey, that's a pretty nice looking SUV. I like the looks of that. I do like the styling. It's different. It's modern though. It's updated and it still gives you that style of roughness and uh, toughness there. They've got a new two-tone color option, as you can see with the black roof. So I think that that's really nice and it stands out on that. So as far as the design goes, it's very capable. It's got a good... Um, lift from the ground, good ground clearance. Uh, these happen to be running 20 inch winters right now. They haven't swapped them over, but all in all, a nice design package, good lighting package. I've had this out at night with the fog lights and the, LED, the rear LEDs and the turn signals and all that stuff. It's very visible, no problems from a visibility aspect. So they've done a good job on the overall design. Uh, and I think Mitsubishi Outlander owners already that have maybe older vehicles are gonna look at this to upgrade. And then people that are looking at an SUV um, and that maybe don't want to go all electric, this would be a good alternative to consider. As I said, this is a big SUV. It's a five passenger, but it also has a two person uh, third row on this option. I'll show you that coming up. Uh, now, one thing I do like about the refresh is that they've upgraded the battery in this. So they went from a 13 and changed kilowatt hour battery to a 20 kilowatt hour battery. And that's a fairly significant increase because it increases the range from somewhere around the 35 to 40 kilometer range uh, now to about 60 kilometers range or 61 is the EPA rated range. And that's actually very valuable range. This week in driving, I've charged it up every night and I've been seeing 61 kilometers on a full charge of range. And that's from temperatures going from about two degrees 
uh, 0 to 2 degrees up to about 10 or 11 degrees C. We've had quite a fluctuating week this, uh, this week weather-wise. The mornings are cool, the afternoons get some sun, we've had some rain. We've had a mixed bag and to me that's pretty good. And again, that's the keys to a plug-in hybrid vehicle is you need to be able to, if you're going to buy one, to maximize the usability of that, the economy savings, and of course maximizing your greenhouse gas emissions as much as possible by lowering them, you want to be plugging this in as much as you can. Now that battery pack powers two motors, comes just in an all-wheel drive configuration uh, and it provides 248 horsepower and 332 pound-feet of torque in the maximum settings. Now I mentioned that this is a PHEV, it's made it to a 2.4 liter uh, uh, four-cylinder engine on this vehicle. It's a fairly robust engine, it's relatively quiet. I haven't heard it uh, uh, when it did come on because I, I did do some drives where I depleted the battery then of course the engine came on but it, uh, it's fairly quiet and it's a seamless experience when the engine goes off and on and it jumps back and forth between battery only mode and engine mode, engine charging the battery, all that kind of stuff. It's very seamless, if you, unless you're watching a graph of it, which I'll show you a bit, coming up in a bit, you really won't know what's happening. You'll see the RPMs go up and down, uh, you know, at zero sometimes, and then it'll jump in. So it's made it to that. Pretty good, uh, pretty good system, again, and trying to maximize, depending on what settings you run at, trying to maximize your EV range. Now I mentioned that this does support DC fast charging. Open the charge port door and you've got two plugs. You've got your standard J1772, which of course gives you a level one, level two. Level one charging in uh, 16 hours. If you're just using the mobile charger that comes with it through a 110, 120 volt outlet, it'll take about that long uh, to get from zero to 100%. And on that 20 kilowatt hour battery, if you're using a level two, they say about six and a half hours. And that's what I've seen, uh, six, about six and a half hours for charging. Uh, so that's okay, and, and again, it's fairly inexpensive, 20 kilowatts, uh, it's, it's not even costing us $2 here to charge that, if I look at the energy rates here in Ontario right now. So it's relatively cheap to go 60 kilometers, it's less than two bucks. So it, now, I mentioned some of the, you know, the way that this vehicle drives, and it does have different driving modes, and as I said a little bit at the top, that that's all automatic and in a lot of the ways that those modes shift. You have your EV mode, which is what I've been running this in. So I've been running this all week in eco mode, with the EV pedal on, so that means that it's gonna use the battery first before anything else until it depletes the battery and then kick in the engine system. You can run this in series mode as well, which gives you the battery plus the engine, and that would be engaged if you're doing passing uh, somebody on a highway or for longer distance drives. Once you deplete the battery, it'll go back and forth in a series mode. And then there's a parallel mode as well for cruising. And that would be, in my, uh, my understanding, is that when you just set it on a cruise control and you're doing 120, 115 for long periods of time, it's going to run in these kind of different modes. The parallel mode running more the engine drive, so the engine actual sending some power to the wheels, where the other two modes, the EV and the series mode, uh, the engine really just sent, just charges the battery, but all the powertrain is still run through the electric motors and through the battery pack. A couple more things to talk about before I show you the interior and then we go on a quick drive. Um, there is some unique equipment. So they do have the equivalent of what they call an e-pedal or an i-pedal type mode. So it does act like the i-pedal when you, when you let off the accelerator, you get both regenerative and or uh, you, the use of the brakes themselves systems, depending on how, on how fast you need to, to stop. Uh, those systems will work together, but predominantly it's regenerative braking until you get to a slow enough speed where it just kind of creeps. Uh, there is no um, eye pedal that will take you, or this pedal will not take you to a full stop. It will take you to a point probably about two kilometers an hour where you're just kind of uh, creeping, and then you need to use the brakes uh, for the rest of the stopping uh, systems. So it's good for various uh, city conditions, uh, even in winter conditions and, and winding roads and downhills because you can pick up that, that regenerative, right? It, it, it allows you the full regenerative power versus the paddles, where you can put this in B mode and play with paddles and, and select different levels of regenerative braking. All right, so let me show you the interior. Have a quick look at the interior. Nice use of materials in the doors and everything. Your standard buttons, memory seats, nice big door pockets. This is the top of the spec trim, of course, folks. So it's gonna have all the nice stuff, leatherette and all this kind of stuff with the stitching. Good size steering wheel, lots of buttons. Everything's fairly intuitive from an operational perspective. Got some buttons down the side, easy to understand. You've got, again, your warning screens and all that kind of stuff here. Um, that stuff is going on. Um, buttons on the steering wheel. Again, everything's fairly straightforward to figure out. Uh, as I mentioned in my driving video, this uh, is uh, looks like the same hardware that Nissan uses. So they've got the ProPilot type hardware installed. 
hence the reason that button works but everything is normal from a functionality it's got a decent size uh screen on it um nothing too uh you know crazy it's kind of more toyota ish i guess than than uh anything else but you can get to the main menu and do different things basic settings not a whole lot here you can schedule some charging and that kind of stuff as well um, one thing i do like about this setup is the separate hvac has very clear and easy controls and i the the controls are responsive and they're easy to find and touch changing the fan speeds uh, upping the temperatures all that kind of stuff putting your defog seat heater seated um, and heated steering wheel are all easy to find i love that because some of the touch screens now are really hard to find stuff and I'd rather have some buttons, and these are all physical push buttons. Um, not, it's not a display to touch. You push these buttons. So I do like that, and it's very easy, and it's dedicated. You've got some buttons down here, of course, for EV mode, the one pedal driving, auto hold, parking brake. Got all your different driving modes from eco to normal to all the different ones that I mentioned earlier. Leave it on eco, eco this uh, slide up to go in reverse, slide down to go into drive, P for parking. Pretty straightforward neutral you just basically put your foot in the brake and then just kind of slide that up if i remember correctly or down up. let's see if we get that going here i did it earlier because i <coughs> went to the car wash let's see well can't figure it out it, it's a little more play to find neutral i'll tell you i did find it when i went to the car wash a couple of cup holders i kind of wish cup holders were more front more here in this area because it's a little hard to reach when you're driving especially somebody shorter got the seat up a little bit decent size console nothing too crazy just standard size nice armrest again very comfortable interior nice big big vanity mirrors especially on the side uh, so they do block a lot you've got a light here a uh, nice uh, mirror with uh, different settings for garage door openers uh, sos button you've got your uh, roof i've got the sunroof open here i can close it one thing i do like is that it has this power shader it is a nice big panoramic piece of glass with uh, the front part that opens and it's got a two-stage um, folding mechanism to uh, block the sun out um, and which works because it can get pretty hot here with this thing open all the time uh, so, but I'll open it up. So that's always a nice touch when the OEMs do that. And I'm going to open the uh, sunroof here. Oops, it does open that way. Here we go. As I learn on demand. So I'm going to close that because it gets windy. I'm going to open it just that way. That's what I wanted. And open that panoramic roof, as you can see, which goes back quite far and quite spacious, spacious, spacious back there. Again, not much going on in the front. Good, again, good pockets. Uh, and the glove box is a standard size glove box. Nothing really to uh, get too excited about. So all in all, very nice front interior. And here's the rear. Again, continuing on with these nice finishes. One thing I do like, uh, maybe it's because the top spec is when they have these blinds here. If you want some privacy, got some kids sleeping, that kind of stuff. Really nice to have these things if you don't uh, fully tint the windows. Now, these do come with a factory tint, as you can see in the back. And the fronts are clear, but the back's got a bit of a tint. So you've got that. That's nice to have. Again, nice seats. You can fold these down easy enough. Pull that, that folds it down. They slide forward. Also, they recline. So as you can see, they recline a few degrees. So if you want to take a nap, I had them set up for, that's a, that's almost straight up and down, of course. And then you want some sort of recline. So I just put them manually that way. So it's nice that they're adjustable for passengers. Not a flat floor, almost a flat floor is a very small hump. Again, uh, this is taking it from an internal combustion. There is an engine, so they have all those components there. And then you have your HVAC, temperature control, seat heaters, um, and a couple of USB. Oh, no, that's your temperatures. So um, I don't see any USB ports. Oh, there they are. It's got to get way down with this thing. USB ports are down over there with something else. Looks Oh, power outlet. Okay, so another AC power outlet if you want to plug a laptop computer in here, do some work. Anyway, center armors, a couple of cup holders, good height, decent roof line, and uh, a nice interior. Some couple map pockets, of course, little things. Again, they're thinking of families to put stuff in, which is nice to have. All right, well, getting in and out of this vehicle should be really easy because it's a nice big vehicle to get in and out. So you can see the doors open almost 90 degrees, which is nice, uh, easy to get in, not too much of a lowering of, of the roof line that you have to duck under really really nice easy tons of leg room i have the seat where i have it again this um is back i believe it's, oh, it goes back even a little farther so that's as far as it back and then i can recline it very comfortable environment good for long trips good job 
All right, if you look at cargo space on this vehicle, it is a pretty good size, and obviously it should be for the type of vehicle that it is in this uh, mid to upper size SUV class. Uh, with the uh, second seat uh, up, it's got, let me look at here, 30.8 cubic feet of cargo space, which is about 872 liters. And if you fold that second row down and to make it all flat, you get, uh, you almost over double it, you get 64.7 cubic feet of storage space or 1,832 liters, which is a lot to take in a Costco run, I'll tell you that much. Now it does have this parcel shelf or hiding uh, shelf uh, as well. Um, I mean, I find a lot of them get pretty flimsy, but it works, so it is there. Now I'll show you the third row and I'm gonna have to take this uh, cover off to do that. All right, so to get to this third row, uh, basically it's a two-step process. You see this flat floor. So basically what you do is you fold this part up. As you can see, it's the seat, the bottom of the seat coming up. Uh, and then you pull this down and this whole mechanism kind of drops. I think it's like that. And then you pull this up, there we go. So you drop the floor first and then this back comes up. Uh, these headrests pop up just like that. There we go. And that's it. So it looks kind of funky with this big headrest, but that's the way it works. I'll show you how it looks like from the inside. All right, gotta use my phone here because I can't get my big camera in this car. So I put the seat up, uh, the third row up, as you see. Now you just lift this lever and the um, seat here folds down and pushes. And that's how much room you get to climb in to get to that back seat. You can see the leg room is pretty small there and the height's not gonna be too bad. It's just gonna be the leg room. You know, I've got this seat back now. It can move up. Even if I put this seat here, let's say, to give you, to give somebody some more room, this reclines a bit, so you can do that. Um, you can see you have to, even for this passenger, you've got a underneath a thing, so you can push it back a bit, let's say there, to get in. Um, you're not looking at a whole lot of space here. Right, with that seat, you can see it's pretty skinny. You know, um, a hand, fist, maybe a little bit more of room. So obviously, you know, these are designed, because if you're gonna utilize this seat as well as that third row, you've gotta have a little bit of leg room here for somebody. So these are really designed for small kids and or car seats, potentially smaller ones at the back, or, you know, for a dog carrier or something like that, they're good for that. Um, again, if it comes with the, the vehicle and you're not paying extra for it, okay, you might find a use for it once in a while, depending on your, your situation. But if this is a paid for option, again, I would strongly recommend not getting it unless you, you absolutely need that third row for, for, what, for the use case that I just mentioned. I'm always a bit flabbergasted when these OEMs offer these third rows and they are, virtually most of them are useless. <laughs> they just do it to get a checkbox in a uh, configurator or people are looking for third row vehicles, they can claim they have them. Nothing wrong with it, but again, if it uh, don't have to pay extra, go for it. You know, you get it if you have to pay extra, really think about it. Now I showed you the back seat. Um, and of course you have to take out the parcel shelf or whatever you call this, the, the cover for the back. Now with that seat up and you, if you're using it, what do you do with this thing? It doesn't collapse. It only squeezes together about an inch or so each side, which means there's not enough room to put this thing back in. I've been, uh, I've been trying for five minutes to figure out a way to put this thing back in with, so I can close the hatch. There's nothing, it can't go under the floor. You, you would have to, even sliding this through to the next row, you hit the, the, the rear seats. Um, like, I don't know, you're gonna have to put this on the floor of the second row, basically, or leave it at home, I guess. You know, don't, don't carry it with the car. I mean, obviously there's no need for it, so I guess that's why, but let's say, you know, you wanted to keep it in the car, you're picking somebody up somewhere, um, you put down the seats, you had this in the car, there's really nowhere to store it, stow it that I could see. Uh, which is interesting. So you would have to throw it in the back row or something, you know, the floor of the second seat just until you got home and then put it away. So it's a, it's a very small thing. I like having the cover, just something that I don't think Mitsubishi thought through. I think they figured that if somebody's gonna put this up, they're gonna do it at home and not have this in the car or not bother to use it. But if you were out and wanted to pick somebody up uh, and use this seat for passengers, then, and you had this installed, yeah, no place to put it but the floor. Oh well. All right, hope you enjoyed all the interior stuff. Now, let's go for a quick drive. All right, just some quick um, thoughts about the driving the Mitsubishi Outlander. 
plug-in hybrid vehicle, electric vehicle, the new one. Um, it's just very similar to the old one. Um, it was a good drive. You know, it's a big SUV. Um, it's heavier than the midsize SUV, so you feel it a bit. But it's got a pretty comfortable ride. I'm still running 20-inch uh, winter tires on here. They haven't swapped them over. But our temperatures have been between, well, right now it's zero degrees Celsius uh, today, and uh, earlier in the week it was up to 11 degrees. So we've been, in the mornings have been cool, getting into, you know, 10, 11 in the afternoons. Um, so uh, this week, as I'm continuing to drive it, I'm seeing around 25 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers for all electric efficiency. Uh, right now, I've plugged it in at every opportunity, which is predominantly overnight and uh, once during the day when I had uh, availability to a charger. So I've been running it pretty well in all electric mode. I haven't touched the gas yet in a couple hundred kilometers of driving. And, you know, that's the beauty of a plug-in hybrid that has a battery that's big enough to give you decent uh, range during the day. You know, this is uh, coming out at about 60 kilometers uh, on a full charge, and it's enough to get me to work and back home with a little bit to spare um, in a given day. So that in combination with, you know, charging it up every night will get you really good efficiencies, and that's what I'm seeing. You know, 25 is, is high, but obviously this is a, a big, heavy, square, squarish vehicle. Um, so that's going to, going to be probably what you get. I think if I had oh, 15 or 20 degrees C, I think I could get that down to the 20 range, maybe even the 19s. We'll have to see if we get nice weather before I return this vehicle. But as far as driving dynamics, a very easy vehicle to drive. The, the automated um, you know, systems as far as four-wheel drive, two-wheel drive, it all works in the background seamlessly. Um, again, I've been running with uh, their version of one pedal. It's not a true one pedal because it won't take you to a stop, but it will slow you down down to basically a creep function and then you have to use the manual brakes to stop the rest of the way. So I've been running the vehicle in that. I've been running it in EV mode so to keep it in EV mode until the battery runs dry and again I haven't um, depleted the battery in driving situations yet. A couple quirks about the auto hold. Um, it makes a little bit of noises here and there like you'll hear the, the rear brakes clamp down. You'll hear some noises from underneath the dash where the brake pedal is I think when it locks in. Uh, once in a while. Uh, the vehicle itself is a little loud when you're in the, the lower speed modes, I guess for the pedestrian warning. It's a little louder than some cars, uh, and I think it clicks in at about 40 kilometers an hour and lower, so it kicks in a little early. Um, but other than that, uh, the car drives fine. You know, it's it's, a, it's an SUV, so it's going to drive like a heavy SUV. Acceleration's good, but the overall driving impressions are good. Good seats, good visibility. Uh, and this does support a wireless CarPlay, and it works extremely well. So the, my hat's off to them on the infotainment from the uh, for CarPlay and Android Auto capabilities. So anyway, that's it for the driving. Let's get back to the rest of the review. So just quickly showing the um, adaptive cruise and lane keep assist here in the Mitsubishi. Uh, we get it going. So it looks like one thing I, I remembered is Mitsubishi, I believe, shares components with Nissan and Renault with that alliance that they have. So the button even on the steering wheel looks like a ProPilot button that you'll see on a Nissan uh, Leaf or on the Aria now that's coming up. And it looks like it uses that same kind of imagery on the dash uh, with the same kind of icons and uh, nice big icons. I like that. So right now I'm in cruise. I'm uh, on a two-lane road. It's keeping the lanes really, really nicely, as you can see. Now it's giving me the warning to grab the wheel nice and big, and then it'll start beeping, and then it'll start disengaging. Um, if it does what it, the Leaf used to do, is it'll actually tap the brakes a few times, and then if you still don't respond, it will um, put the hazards on and actually stop the vehicle in lane. Uh, so I may test that and see if that does it. I just, it's busy right now, so I don't want to try that in a busy road. But it uh, looks like it's um, every, I don't know, 10 to 15 seconds it's coming up. Uh, obviously keeping the road well. Um, I've only touched the wheel just to nudge it. It's been staying in lane. It's slowing down based on the spacing with the vehicle in front of me, as you can see. Um, and uh, it does a pretty good job here. It'll probably lose it in the intersection here. Let's see. Uh, nope, it maintained it. It lost the lanes, but it maintains the cruise. So it did lose the lane keeping, and you have to kind of drive it for a while before it re-engages as you heard the beep. Uh, one last thing about this is I do really like uh, the Nissan systems. If that's what it looks like this is based on ProPilot because of that audible chimes. So I, I really like having an audible system to let you know when it disengages because so many of these adaptive cruise lane keeping 
uh, level two autonomy systems don't let you know when they disengage. They just, you know, the screen changes. And if you're, some of the icons are very small. And if you're not paying attention, um, which you should be, but if you're not, um, you'll find out that the car starts drifting out of lane and you're going, what's going on? So, especially for the lane keeping, um, the adaptive cruise is pretty straightforward. But for the lane keeping, when that disengages, you know, especially if you're halfway through a turn or something, um, it could catch you off guard. So it's really nice to have that audible sound if uh, to confirm when it's active and to confirm when it disengages or goes inactive. Uh, it's really nice for that. So good job on Mitsubishi. This is handling the roads quite well. Um, even that those turns that I just did uh, kept it nice and straight and um, it's doing a great job. So definitely a nice system uh, for, again, taking some of the stress away from long distance traveling. All right, so hope you enjoyed the driving. Now, my driving summary, again, it's really hard. Some, some of these uh, plug-in uh, hybrid vehicles don't give you a lot of stats. Uh, some of them will tell you how many kilometers you've driven in electricity versus uh, EV only and that kind of stuff. This, this gives you a percentage. So it gives you some efficiencies and a, and a percentage. So what I've been able to figure out now, in my just a few days of driving this, I've done uh, 317 kilometers. I full charge it every night using my house charger at home. And I had a, an opportunity as well to charge it a little bit as well at a workplace charger. So I did that. And I was able to get 244 kilometers out of that 317 of all electric. So using the battery only, which, with, which left 73 kilometers of using gas. Uh, I've used about an eighth of a tank of gas, uh, just over, just less than an eighth of a tank, not even, a, I'm not, not at a quarter yet. So about an eighth of a tank of gas. Uh, to do that and uh, it calculated that 70%, 77% of my driving was in all electric or utilizing the battery, which makes about sense. So if I look at financial savings, and that's one of the benefits even with a plug-in hybrid that you can get is financial savings. If I were to do 20,000 kilometers a year, let's say about 55 kilometers a day in driving on average, as I mentioned to go from zero to 100 on this battery costs less than $2 for overnight charging. But if I do that every night that I'm going to uh, run this vehicle and I, and I do that 20,000 a year, I'm going to save somewhere around, even if I look at 60% uh, of battery use, I was at 77. So at 60%, I'm saving around $2,000 a year. Even if it's at 50%, I'm saving maybe about oh, 1,800 or so dollars a year. 1,500 to $2,000 should not be hard to save in a year over gas. And that alone warrants, you know, the price points. And these typically are a little bit higher priced than some of the gas ones. You'll have to check your region for all your firm pricing. So very efficient from, uh, from as much efficiency that you're going to get in a big plug-in hybrid. Uh, and again, that's one of the benefits of you, you looking at this vehicle for what it is. All right, so pricing on the Mitsubishi uh, starts in Canada at 46500 and change and goes up to just over $57,000. So it's got widespread. There's six different uh, trim uh, models, starting with the ES and going up to the GT Premium. This one's the top of the line. They all qualify for the $5,000 Canadian federal incentive, so that's good because of the big battery. So you can get $5,000 off of these. Plus, if you live in provinces that have incentives as well, you can stack those together and get more money. So it definitely is a good value when you look at it from the uh, costing perspective. So do I recommend this vehicle? Hey, you guys know that I do like uh, plug-in vehicles that have a battery. That's good enough for all day use. This one does. I like the 2019. Uh, Outlander, when I reviewed it, that had a slightly bigger battery, and I like this one even more because of the bigger battery. So certainly it's a thumbs-up recommendation. Again, for those that are, don't want to take the plunge into all electrics, this is a great stepping stone, has a good enough battery for most da daily use applications, and will save you money over the course of the year. Uh, anywhere from, I'd say, $1,500 to over $2,000 on fuel savings if you plug it in every night. 
All right, and that's it for this edition of the EV Revolution show. Again, I want to thank Mitsubishi Canada for the use of this vehicle. Uh, it's been fun driving around in it. And again, uh, all the uh, information on how to reach me, interested in Patreon, you can see all that stuff. Also, all my Patreon supporters, always a humble thanks. So stay tuned for all that coming up at the end of this episode in the closing credits. But again, thanks very much for watching. Everybody stay safe. And until the next episode, until the next time I see you, whenever that is, the next episode, take care and I'll see you then.